All right, I think it's going. Okay, so um, I want to go over the latest proposal, and I wrote a few things out here. This is going to be for the Lucas group, and the idea is this type 1 interferon promote autoreactive B cells in lupus nephritis. And the premise is that um, autoreactive plasmaglass promote renal, renal disease in SLE. But the problem is, um, nobody knows what, what is the mechanism for plasma blasts developing the autoreactivity. Uh, and, and, and then, do they really promote renal disease? Because maybe, we, maybe the renal disease may not be always related to these plasma blasts. So, so, so the idea is, let me just go through some of the key uh, preliminary data that's premise based on. One is that we already studied both human and mouse. Um, autoreactive B cells development. And we noted that type 1 interferon promotes this um, such B cell development. You know, we have the, um, the type interferon beta knockout mouse and the reconstitution model. And we also studied the, the, oh, here it's VXC2 at the transitional stage uh, that there's uh, tolerance loss or not if the B cells go into. Uh, Go into, the, go into the spleen at a certain stage, we can find different stages of development. And we can see, here's important, this is a new thing, is if interferon beta is first, endogenous interferon beta is first, then TLR7 is second. And we'll get later on how TLR7 uh, activation will say TLR7 tolerance loss can promote interferon gamma signaling. It's a little bit of a mismodel, but here, TLR7, and then interferon gamma signaling and then you get the TBAT plasma glass and the allo-reactive plasma cells. But the key thing is, go through right here, this is actually in, a, a mentioned because we're going to have actually in that lupus map, we're going to have preliminary data about that. So all of the old stuff with human and mouse, but that's all the, uh, mostly at the transitional stage, early stage of development. Now we're going to focus, new thing here is focus on the plasma glass. The second thing that the premise is based on is We've observed uh, uh, in using signal cell analysis in SLE, the new data is increased interferon beta occurs in, uh, in SLE. It's in the B cell, it promotes all the B cell. Uh, it promotes, it's higher in the auto, uh, African Americans, and it's, uh, it's related to anti SN, anti DNA in the sera of those patients. And it's also important, it's related to renal disease. So it already shows the direct connection between high interferon beta uh, in ANA B, uh, African American B cells and renal disease. But it doesn't show how that works. Is it just how does interferon, high, high interferon, lead to these, um, how, how, why is it associated with renal disease? It, and is it, uh, is it through antibodies? Although it is related to antibodies, and the most important, the most highly correlated one is SN. So <clears throat> there's a few unanswered questions. The new data to go into the progress report, I think, we haven't published it, but we tried, is the 47 SLE patients. And this is important because nobody wants to see two or four or something like that. That's why we're doing the experiments we're doing now. But 47 SLE subjects, we did the flow cytometry in all of them, uh, and they show um, that there is a mutually exclusive populations of either ISG positive. Uh, B cells, that is, some that may have an interference in them, so the interference in the genes are high, or uh, IL-4 receptor is high, BAC-2 is a, trans is a factor. Um, that's not in the 47 people, but you know, you get, you get this dichotomy, you cannot have both ISG and IL-4 receptor, which both can be measured. Actually, this is interference beta, but, um, you know, but in in the cells, yeah, well this is, actually this is interferon data, so in the cells we can measure this. Um, but we did show at the same time, as a mechanistic way to understand this, is you can culture people. When you take the, all the B cells, this is total B cells in culture, and, and you can divide those into first double negative based on no expression of IgG, so they're, they're, they're naive, but you know, they're not IgD positive, so they're not, um, or I guess they are IgD, IgD negative. And 
in CD27, so they're not memory, so they're down here double negative. And then based on that, we have the genetic ones. Uh, we have low expression of CD21 and increased expression of uh, TBM called DN2, and DN2 is increased. And this is increased if you take the B cells and culture them, uh, and this is actually the, maybe you might think of it as the activated naive state because they have TBM positive. And the way to do that, you culture them with the cocktail of things that includes um, T, uh, TLR7, but also in this case, you have to put it in a good game. So, uh, so it's as if it already shows that TLR7 can break TLR7 tolerance, and then it, and you can put in other things like IL4, um, you know, survival factors. But TLR7 can break tolerance, and then it, then that enables signaling through interferon gamma. I don't know about what happen if you don't put in, and it's not TLR7, it's RU486 or something, you know, it's uh, TLR7 slash 9 stimulator. But in any event, I don't know what would happen if you just put in interferon gamma. Would that do it all by itself? Probably not. <coughs> but, so, but this shows that TLR7 sets a stage for interferon gamma, <coughs> which is the same as over here. Here's TLR. T TLR7 signaling. Here, this is TLR7. Outbreak is IRF7, and that, along with uh, NF gamma B, stimulates interferon gamma um, receptor, and then that allows interferon gamma to signal, and you know, this, this interferon gamma. So that outbreak is TBM. So there's a step, that, <coughs> the step that's missing here <coughs> is we, we have TLR7, but the step that's missing is does this. Does this go through the, that thing I mentioned, NF kappa B and uh, NF kappa B and I, P, uh, IRF7, which is the Those are the downstream things from TLR7. We know NF kappa B because it's NF kappa B and IRF7. And then that goes to I interfering with gamma receptor. But it facilitates it. It may not be upregulation at the gene level, but somehow enables it to signal. Maybe the gene level. There's two receptors. But anyway, then it's, then you can stimulate with I and gamma, and that's what is here. So we did. We put in TLR7 plus I and gamma, and you wait a long time. So actually, way down here, there's a there's a aim to look at kinetics. You know, so I I think it might be interesting to look at. And we're doing a TLR7 and then look at upregulation of these factors, which is hard to do with any kind of but maybe the pathway, and I have seven. And finally, later, you see this facilitated in an infant gamma, and then finally, the TBF positive B and twos. So, but <coughs> we, we know that works, but down here is the mechanism. That's 47 SLE patients, and then uh, they've been cultured like that, many of them. Now, what about mechan mechanistically? Uh, in the single cell level, we also show in single cell analysis, ISG and IL4R populations are mutually exclusive. So here we get this kind of model here. The, uh, that, that the mechanism is, I, well, it brings up a question. I think it's down here too. The question is, which is, which is first? Is it I, ISG and TLR7? And overwhelm, which occurs early, we already know it's a T1 stage or T2. Is that overwhelm IL4, suppress IL4 receptor signal? Or, or is IL4 receptor signaling there all the time? Actually, that's in the model too, because in the model I do, I put IL, you know, IL4 receptor on, in, on there. And the question was, I, I think that blocks this, but it could be this blocks that. So that's. And then it's something we can test. In fact, it looks like it goes both ways. Because um, uh, in, uh, type 1 interference in one, uh, caught, you know, right here, promotes DN2. But if you pre treat the dial 4, then it blocks that. But if you pre treat again the interferon beta, then it doesn't block that. So the interferon beta IL4, then it sort of doesn't work. <coughs> okay, so, so now the new. So we got to introduce a new concept here, a couple of new concepts. One is plasma blast developmental stages. So we build those up. So plasma blast, we know that that one paper uh, can 
define pre, there's two things, plasma blasts, two stages, pre-plasma blasts and plasma blasts. In two stages of then they go to plasma cells, two stages, the pre-plasma cell and the plasma cell. Plasma cell could go to bone marrow and tissue. So the pre-plasma blast and plasma blast stage, uh, there's a paper, we looked at the paper and then we did the analysis. The MKI 67 is high in the pre-plasma blast and plasma blast. Makes sense because of blasts. So they're cycling. And then also you see here a transitional gene, CD69A is up during the plasma blast, the pre-plasma cell. Also there's a homing uh, receptor, CHCO3, that's up in the pre-plasma cell. Finally, in a mature plasma cell, there's a certain genes like RGS1 and 2 that are up regulated. RGS1 and 2 being up regulated is a G-protein signaling. That will turn off um, certain chemokine receptor signaling or G-protein receptor signaling. So maybe that, that's how why those are up. <clears throat> the other thing we know is if we look at these three stages, we can see in SLE patients compared to normal that there's that uh, we don't have uh, all the uh, reactivity worked out, but we do know VH434 and 439 tend to be autoreactive ones. 434 is the famous, you know, uh, 9G4, you know, the anti DNA B region. That's kind of high in SLE. So we can, we can trot out our data for that and show that in uh, SLE, uh, you tend to get, we don't know this exactly, you can look at the sort of like the Disney plots maybe are the UMAP plots. And you see different stages of development. Let's say this is one, two, three. Uh, uh, this does not mean I work out, but you can, then you can say, how many are 434? And you see so many in stage one, fewer in stage two, and not that many in stage three. Indicating as plasma cells, plasma cells, or plasma blasts that plasma cells develop, there's a sort of a block. However, I don't, I don't know if that works, so we have to look at that a little bit. And normal, Normally there's a block, and SLE not a block. There's more of these autoreactive 434 plasma cells. So that may be the case. Um, so based on all that, AIM-1 is very clear. You know, to detect if autoreactive plasma blasts um, development occurs, the plasma blast autoreactive can develop, uh, and, and is that regulated by type 1 interferon receptor signal? We already sort of know that type 1 interferon receptor signaling, as you mentioned, well, let's say up here, will type 1 interferon receptor signaling, TLR signaling, TLR7, will indeed uh, facilitate um, interferon gamma, but we don't know about plasma blasts, this, this stage. So, uh, you know, we know that what do you call it? The activated naive is sort of back here, and they can be induced to become plasma cells and produce autoantibodies. So we could put the other back here. This could be this could be the activated naive. We call it it's still a naive investing naive. Go back to that model. And to do that, you need interfering gamma, and T bad is high, and this is probably a precursor to that stage. So so basically, is is uh, is, and this requires TLR7, but it also requires interferon gamma. So it's kind of complicated, I guess. But we also know, we can just look at the transcriptome at the B cells as they develop, and we know that the type of uh, TLR signaling uh, is, is there, and we don't know if it's type one, type 1 TLR signaling or just ISGs, but ISGs are there and they tend to um, be there during different developmental stages in the SLE, but not in normal. So now here's a here's a trick. We see all that we saw that for total B cells to some extent. But what we don't know is about our autoreactive B cells. So in order to get to autoreactive B cells, we have our new uh, we we have our new um, is enabled by this new reagent, the anti SM or the SM barcode. Uh, you know, just sort of like the, S, the, the SM peptide that's barcoded, and also histone uh, that's barcoded. We, we're going to study just um, autoreactive B cells specifically and use normal B cells in the same person in the control. And of course, we do it in uh, S, SLE in normal people. So we have normal controls versus SLE, and we have in, in SLE and those, we have 
autoreactive B cells and normal B cells. For example, I think normal B cells, I mean, yeah, I mean, a normal person, normal B cells will be, normal B, autoreactive B cells will be there, but you know, we think they're tolerant. You know, they don't have high activation levels and they may just be, um, they're there, not even higher, uh, but they're not, we have to look at an activation signal. Somehow they're there, but they're, but they're energic. And I don't know whether that means, if they're energic, will they stop at some stage or not go to the tissue, not express RGS, so they'll be, but you know, we know from that one patient. Yeah, and then one second. Yeah, but there's fewer, but do, do they, do, what is it that, as they go through this stage, do they stop? They stop at the cell. Right, they stop here. But I think they're there because everybody has them. And so does an SLE patient then continue to go with their, if you sort the SN positive ones, will they continue to go to this stage? And so that's, and then is it specific for autoreactive B cells versus the total B cells? Because total B cells should not have a problem going through this. You know, so uh, we, can, we can guess, you know, we can sort of view the 434 data. But you know, but once we get the SM sorted cells, we can really see that is it you know like even in SLE patients they can make they can make B cells at a certain rate and they can make autoreactive B cells and they can progress to the plasma cell plas plasma plas plasma cell stage. Is it the same rate? Maybe who knows? Maybe even amplified relative to this, so you get more autoreactive ones. And then and and then uh, or or just no no sort of loss. So but. But in a normal person, you certainly would hope that this gets trimmed down. But it may be that you end up in plasma blast, free plasma cells that have IL. No, they don't have IL four receptor. But somehow they're not. Uh, they're, they're tolerant, you know. And I guess we could do. We can look at that by do they. I think they're tolerant because the first step they don't have high signal. Yeah. They're there, but they're tolerant. Type you, 1, prime B cells be sensitive to TR7. Yeah. So they're somehow, that that we would say, but well, that might have happened earlier. You know, because right. it, happened it, it happened earlier. And even though they can develop, they can't get very far. And it's how far can they get? But they probably won't be sitting there as a, as a late say plasma blast. They wouldn't be inefficient to make a cell where they can come up. So that's why we do those two things. And then, this is the last checkpoint. Right, final checkpoint. That's good we'd say. Okay, B is, you know, because now once we get the B cells and we get them out and we sort them, we can study the transcriptome, we also will have the DDJ uh, single cell, uh, you know, heavy and light chain. And we can confirm that the, uh, that the, the SM positive B cells that survive in lupus are actually high affinity towards SM. You know, we can show here the Western plot, you know, show Tom Joe's nice Western plot. And we get the 30 and the 15, K, 30 and 15. This is, I guess, B and D, one and two, technically. You know, so we get SM, B and D affinity. And we can show that patients with renal disease definitely, or, patients with SM definitely bind both of those. There doesn't appear to be any correlation, I mean, you know, we know this, not sure how it correlates, but we should at least determine, we can be, see people that bind high or low, you know, like 179 bind low, so. So, but, you know, but we want to at least show that the SM do bind SM, you know, what percentage actually bind that somehow specific. Maybe that could go first. But the other thing is somatic augmentation and clamp switch, uh, or somatic augmentation. Do they have somatic augmentation? Well, uh, but the R, we can look at the SM in the patient, because we've got the sera, and compare the, uh, compare the binding of SM and the sera to this, somehow to show that these B cells that that finally make it, you know, we'll select on the ones that have final terminal plasma and cell differentiation. We can group, we got those, and here are their B regions. 
And there's, is there a difference between the binding ability of those compared to the, to the normal, who also have SM, maybe not at that stage? Is, is something, is the affinity greater uh, as the B cell matures? You know, it's something about the antibody. We've got to do something with the antibody because we can clone it. Some others, you know, of course, it'd be nice to show the pathogenic, but we, it, it's hard to do that. The other thing we might do is once we get these antibodies, we can show they can bind to the kidney right. tissue. All right, all right. So it's it's like we can do it. So we got the we got the collaboration with the renal and see if they get the tissue. We got tissue, the remnant tissue section. And we just see if these, if there's a difference in binding of the, of the SM, especially the ones that are the plasma, blast, or plasma cell terminal RGS1 and 2. Those heavy and light chain ones, you reconstruct those using um, twist, do they bind to the remnant tissue biopsy section of the ones with renal disease? And we can use the control renal disease biopsy for some of the diseases as a control, but there should be increased binding and we'll show maybe it even binds to, you know, uh, the type 5 or membranous, the lumpy, bumpy stuff down there. But that's, at least we show that in that patient, and then we can see how much it reacts with, with other people, you know, so, so that would be it, since it's renal disease, it's been renal disease, so obviously testing on the tissue section, but we have to actually show we can do that in the, before the end. But this is actually in the Clement, it's actually in a paper, uh, what do you call it? Yeah. Um, what do you call it? Letter of intent. It's a renal disease binding. Okay, number two is the mechanicity. And here, we go back to this mechanism right here. That is that, um, go back to the key thing, the concept that um, in B cells, uh, the, the current concept is, of course, that, uh, as you see here, um, this is nucleic acid sensing. Uh, it's on camera. Nucleic acid sensing uh, promotes TLR7. That promotes type 1 interferon. And that promotes ISGs. And then that's it. And, that's the, that's, and then that causes all the problems. <clears throat> so then the ISGs, and then the, cell, the B cell loses its tolerance um, through many, many of those genes downstream. But what we propose is for a plasma cell, it's, um, this may occur, but TLR7, well, first off, we showed even uh, back way up here with our family data that IRF7 is not secondary, but IR, uh, that, nucle uh, that nucleic acid benzene requires type 1 interferon first, interferon beta. No interferon beta, there's no uh, TLR7. You know, I really like the math equation. There's also no TLR4 signal. So interferon beta being there is the first step. So interferon beta is first, and then you get nucleic acid, uh, or you get TLR sensing in nucleic acid or TLR4, and then you get an amplification of type 1, and you show like a positive feedback loop of type 1 signals all over the place, including other interferons <coughs> and the interferon signature genes. So the, the, if we sort of modify that concept, that, uh, that endogenous interferon beta is the first thing and TLR signaling is next. So that means TLR signaling can, is, a, is sort of a switching point. It can be on or off. It can be tolerant or not, depending on whether there's interferon beta there. And unfortunately, we don't know why interferon beta is there. But, but anyway, that's the, that's, the, that's the regulator. The regulator is TLR signaling right here. It could be interferon beta. It's a, could be IF, as you see, IF4 receptors in a negative way. But anyway, in a plasma cell, TLR, you know, um, EL, your buddy. EL? Your buddy, uh, my buddy. Pennsylvania. Zia. Zia. Zia showed, Zia showed that TLR7 signal is critical. You don't need, uh, remember, you, you know, the TLR7 signaling is independent of the interferon. Somebody, you know, my buddy, Kelly, uh, Joanne, 
Kelliger or something. So the TLR7 uh, activation is critical. We have it in our figure too, by the way. Our little figure in that paper shows that the next, the first step is TLR7 assembly is, is important. And so TLR7 assembly, so TLR7 activation uh, through uh, like a CL264 and ubiquinol is the first step towards a lot of things. And it's a first step towards the early stage, but it's also the first step towards interferon beta and mate step. But I want to make it seem like interferon beta must be first, then you get TLR7 assembly, and then that carries forward somehow. That, that imprints a signal for TLR7 signal to be even at the late stage. But at the late stage, since we're talking about plasma, we can get into all that. We always thought TLR7 was the key determinant. It's not interfering beta, but that, I mean it is, but it's necessary for TLR7. But having TLR7 being the activated, activatable state is the critical thing. So in a plasma blast, same thing, this is what Zia showed, is that TLR7 signaling is critical for interferon receptor upregulation and Step one signaling and so forth, but TLR7, not uh, not uh, interferon, or not. It acts through type 1, it acts through type 2 interferon. Right, TLR7 acts through type 2 interferon. Yeah, right. TLR7 doesn't turn on interferon, type 1 interferon, type 1 interferon, <coughs> to cause the disease. TLR7, interestingly, acts through type 2 interferon. Now, we show interferon beta turns on TLR7. Then TLR7 turns on interferon response genes. So that's early on. But there the idea is TLR7, you stimulate it, that actually also activates type 2 interferon. So that's later stage, later stage. At that stage, you get then you get type 2 interferon, at least ability to signal. And whether it upregates a receptor or it upregates a pathway. We're, we're not sure, but that's right here. TLR7 activates in a, probably through right here, probably through NFKLB and IRF7. That upregulates interferon receptor or signaling, and then that, that upregulates the ability to signal through interferon beam. So basically, aim two is to investigate that mechanism. So we take um, the B cells from, again, it's going to be probably auto reactive B cells sort of here, um, and study them. In vitro, uh, this is this is a study fresh out of the patient. But here we take the same cells, put them in vitro, and we see if TLR7 uh, uh, TLR7 can activate through activated through CL264 or Vecna, uh, like Zia did, can indeed lead to um, this sort of a this sort of a this sort of a mechanism. Whereas in normal uh, as we as you said, we're studying these uh, these stages of the activation right here, pre PD, pre PD, PD, pre PC, PC. Study those stages. Is this those are these stages? And does it does it go through all the stages in uh, uh, is in uh, you know in SLE patients and end up making autoantibody? And we're going to sort the cells, so there should be. Auto reactive, but we can look at normal and auto reactive, same as same as we're going to do here. Um, normal and that's uh, normal and auto reactive, similar to that. But, um, oh, normal D and auto reactive D. So uh, normal and auto reactive D. And I think for this one to do the kinetics, so it's in vitro, so you want to look at early time points. So you look, you first you put in the TLR7, and then you look at how that signals, you know, up to the you know, NFT IR7. Then you look at Interferon receptor, you know, uh, regulation, the message, and, and signal, signal through that, and then you look at, of course, uh, step, um, step, what is it, step one, right. downstream interferon, interferon gamma, and then that upregulates feedback transcription down here. So you look at that at different times. So you sort the cells from uh, normal, normal and SLE, and with or without renal disease. And you may pull out, say, we're only done with an auto reactant. And then you, then you do these, this stimulation to set this thing in motion and look and see if you get more auto 
uh, plasma cells that are, that are autoreactive in the lumen station. Increase plasma cell development. And then aim two, going B would be, given all this, then it's a treatment aim, you know, it's where you even put an NF cattle B or a TLR7 antagonist. There are such things, some drugs, but TLR7 antagonists, you know, um, are possible. So I guess that's about it. All right.